Hey guys, today I want to talk about database normalization. This is one of the things that isn't really well understood by accountants, and unfortunately, accountants are the kind of people who think that Excel can just run the world. Unfortunately, it just can't. And we get a lot of basically IT people who laugh at us. The thing about normalization is that it's actually not that hard, and I'm gonna show you a few ways to basically cheat and get the answer that you want. There are so many great YouTube videos that'll show you exactly what you wanna do. All you need to do is go to that YouTube search button and search for normalization to third normal form. You will find hundreds out there. The thing about them is that they are written basically for database people. And for accountants, we need to understand what normalization is because we need to understand how do databases and relationships work because Excel can't do everything, unfortunately. So let's get to it. My sneaky cheating way basically depends on seven major steps. Step one is to draw the REA or the real diagram. Step two is to do the cardinalities. Step three is to identify any special relationships. And these can be a one to one relationship or they can be a something many and a something many. But the important thing is that the, the many side is the maximum on both sides. The next one is to count the number of tables and write those out. Step five is to identify and allocate any primary keys. Step six is to allocate any foreign keys. And step seven is to allocate all other fields. So I know that these steps have problems, but you know what, they're easy to understand and most of the time they'll get you to the right answer. Let's put this to the side for the moment. So, step one is to draw your REA diagram. Let's do one for sales. We're going to start off with our basic REA diagram structure. So this is going to give us our resources, our events, and our agents. So since this is our sales database, we can go ahead and put sales as the main event. The corresponding event would be a cash collection, otherwise known as a receipt. When we sell stock out, that would be our resources, stock, inventory. Cash collection will then be deposited into a bank account. So this is a list of bank accounts right here. Our agents will then have a salesperson and we'll also have a customer as the outsider. This will then result in a cash collection collected by a cashier. Also, I'd like to apologize if I've got any spelling mistakes or stupid handwriting. I am the generation that basically just grew up with keyboards in their fingers. I should probably quickly go ahead and fill these in. Inflow, outflow, inside, outside, outside, inside, and this one here is a duality. Let's suppose two things about this business. Number one, that you must actually pay in full upon the sale. Today, let's just think about a normal business that consumers would go to where they actually have to pay for everything when they want to buy it. And so in this sense, each and every time we pay for something, we are going to have a sale, and every time we sell something, we're going to get cash, otherwise there's going to be no sale. And number two, and any sale can involve many items of stock. Of course, customers can buy more than one thing per sale, otherwise every single time they buy a thing, they're going to have to have a separate invoice with separate transactions, and that would be stupid. Why not simply give them a shopping cart, in which case they can just keep buying more and more stuff, and at the end of it, they're going to go to the checkout and pay for it all. So we can go ahead and fill out our cardinalities right now. For each and every stock, there must be at least zero or possibly n number of sales. Every single sale will involve at minimum one piece of stock, otherwise it wouldn't have occurred, or indeed many uh, items of stock. <clears throat> 
Of course, customers don't actually want to have a single invoice for each and every item they purchase. I mean, think about it when you go down to the supermarket. You don't actually want to have a transaction per item. That would just be stupid. Each and every bank account can be involved with zero or one cash collection every single time we get money. We're going to deposit that in one and only one bank account. Every single time that we sell something, we must actually receive money. And every time we get money, we know it's because we sold something. Every single salesperson can be involved with zero or many sales. Every single sale will have one and only one salesperson. In the same way that each invoice will only be issued to one and only one customer, as will the same for a receipt. Every customer will only be on our database because they have at least one sale to them, or they could be a repeat customer and come back many times. So likewise, this should also be one in for exactly the same reason. We know that this will be 1-1 one, one because every cash collection must be collected by a cashier and every single cashier can basically collect zero because this is their first day or alternatively it can be many because, well, they've worked here for a long time. What we have done now is we have drawn our REA diagram and we've done the cardinalities. So that is now done. Now we need to find any uh, relationships that are essentially 1, 1, 1, 1, like this, or any maximum n to maximum n relationships like that. We can see that we have a maximum n, maximum n relationship right here, and this will give us the need for a matching table. So most customers are going to be getting their little shopping cart, putting things in that shopping cart, and at the end of it, they're going to go to the checkout. It's one sale, but it's going to contain many items. At the same time too, we're only going to collect cash if we make a sale, and every single sale will imply that we're actually going to collect cash, because otherwise, if you don't have any money, then you will not have a sale. So we're going to collapse all of this into a single table right here. So that pretty much means that we've now done step three. Now we need to have a look at step four, which is count the number of tables and write those out. So if I count these, I can see that I need table one, two, three, and three includes all of this, four, five, six, and this last table here, that's a seven table, and that's because we now have a matching table due to our many, many relationship right there. So, all I do is I count those tables out, and I write them out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now I'm going to write the names of the tables in red just to make this nice and easy. The first one is going to be stock. The next one is going to be bank. The next one is going to be sales. I'm just going to call it sales because sales and cash collection have been collapsed into a single item. The next one is going to be salesperson. Next one's going to be customer. Next one's going to be cashier. And the final one is going to be an amalgam between stock and sales. So we're just going to go ahead and call this stock dash sales. So we've now completed step four. The next thing we need to do now is issue each one of these tables primary keys. So I'm gonna do these primary keys in pink just to make these look obvious. The primary key for stock would be inventory ID or even just stock ID. The bank, we can call that a bank ID. The sales, we're gonna call that an invoice number. Salesperson, we can call that uh, sales ID, I suppose. Customer, we can just call it cust ID. We'll write it in full this time. Cashier, again, we'll also call it cashier ID. And the stock sales is the interesting one here because you're going to get a double concatenated key. So the primary key that is in the sales table, namely the invoice number, and the stock ID, which is in the stock table, will both come to form a double primary key in this one here. So the first thing we want to have is the stock ID, and then we're going to have the invoice number after that. 
we can go ahead and put a comma between that. Now because these are all primary IDs, I'm going to put a double underline underneath these to make it obvious. I've actually done this in different colors, but of course in the exam you probably won't have time to do this in different colors. You just do this in one pen and you want to quickly run a double underline to tell the person who's reading this which one of the primary keys and which one of these are the uh, foreign keys. Now after that we can go ahead and allocate our foreign keys and I'm going to do the foreign keys in a light blue to try and make it obvious which one's which. So between the stock and the sales we've got this uh, double primary um, keyed matching table here and that's table number seven so I don't need to do anything else there. Between the sales and the cash collection well that basically doesn't exist because there is this one 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 relationship which means that we're all going to collapse this into a single table so there's no need to consider that one anymore. Between the bank and the sales we do have a relationship which you need to consider and so it makes sense to say okay for each bank account, how many sales would that relate to? Or indeed, it'd be far easier to go for each and every sale, how many bank accounts will that relate to? Well, that's going to be one and only one. So in the sales table, we're going to put the bank ID as a foreign key. So in the sales table, I am going to use the bank ID as a foreign key. And as a foreign key, I'm just going to put a single underline to make that obvious. So just to repeat that, the pink is equal to primary keys, which I use a double underline to tell the difference between the two. And the blue, I'm going to make that into a foreign key. And I'm only going to put a single underline to make that obvious. Great, so I've got this one. I don't need to do this one. I've now done this one. Now I need to think between the sales and the salesperson, which one am I going to use as the primary key, which one am I going to use as the foreign key? Well, for each and every time we issue an invoice, we know that we're going to have one and only one salesperson. So I'll give you a hint here. You see this one, 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 one. It pretty much means that on this side, we're going to include the salesperson in there. We're going to include the customer in there. And we're going to include the cashier if indeed that we're using a different person there for cashier. Same thing goes with the bank. So here, the sales is going to include the bank ID. We've got that. It's now going to include the salesperson ID. It's going to include the customer ID. And it's also going to include the cashier. Wonderful. I probably should do these in red too to make these consistent. Now pretty much we just need to go ahead and allocate all the other fields as our final step, step seven. I'm going to do this in black to make this really obvious. So under the stock I might have a description, I might have a recommended retail price, I might have a location so I can find it in my data in my uh, warehouse, so forth dot 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 you get the idea for the bank account I may wish to describe the BSB number and the account number the name of the bank those sorts of details dot 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 and the sales I may wish to have the date that's pretty much it for the moment I can think of for the salesperson I may wish to have their name their family name maybe the tax file number, those sort of details. Customer will want to have their first name, family name, ABN number. I really shouldn't say ABN number because it's an Australian business number number, but whatever. Dot, dot, dot. Next one's going to be cashier, which is going to be very much like salesperson as well. And the final one is going to be stock sales. Now, we're, what we're trying to say is on this particular invoice we sold that particular piece of stock and the problem is, is that we need to know what was the quantity we actually sold. So be very careful with quantity because quantity always pretty much has to go in that matching table which is this table right here. 
quantity doesn't make sense here in the stock because if you're actually talking about the quantity of the stock, you're saying how much of this have I got on hand. And in the sales, you're not actually able to break down exactly what you've got on that particular sale for a particular invoice because that would be what that matching table tells you, but not the actual sales table itself. So quantity pretty much has to go here. Also, another thing that I'm going to draw attention to is price. Price only ever goes here in the stock sales where you have a variable price. I put a big question mark next to that because normally price is located all the way up here in the stock value. And what you're basically saying is this particular item of stock was sold at that particular price. And so if you have a fixed price, then it has to go in this table. However, if you have a variable price, then it will go in here. But I want you to be very, very careful with price. And let's say that there might potentially be other details which you are also interested in. That pretty much brings us to step seven. And this is a very, very simple way to go from an REA diagram down to the cardinalities, which of course is an intuitive step, down to identifying any special relationships, such as our 1111, which gives us basically a collapsed table, or a max N to a maximum N, which will give us our matching table here. We can then count these, so we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 tables here and we're going to write those out as I have done so here in red. The next thing is then to allocate the primary keys which is usually pretty much just the name of the table plus ID at the end so that's dead set easy. Then we need to decide where our foreign keys are going to sit and this should be somewhat intuitive but I'll give you a hint basically if there's one one on this side then the primary key of the cashier is going to be sucked in over there as we can see right here and then finally, we need to allocate all those other fields, which I have done so in black here. Now, basically, this answer here is a third normal form. So if you liked this video and it was much easier to understand than what your tutors are telling you, make sure you give me a big like. Let me know how I went in the comments below and share it with your friends as well so that they too can pass the test. Happy study, guys.